Today I want to read to you from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to start with verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 12. By the way, we live in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. And uh, we had most, my most recent ministry was, uh, it's only one ministry, was uh, we started a church in Hancock, Maryland. And we did that through the Blue Ridge Baptist Association. And that's how Bruce knows me and how he put us together this morning. And, uh, but Bruce Connolly led us. And uh, we left there in 2018. I Still, still do a lot of preaching, and I also work at MCTC, Maryland Correctional Training Center, as a correctional officer in Hagerstown, Maryland. So, I uh, have a lot of opportunities to witness and be a testimony there as well, both among staff and those who are incarcerated. Second Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 12, says, We do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. But if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Behold, for now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had this morning to sing praises to you, to pray together, study your word, and now we have another opportunity to proclaim your word, to hear your word, and then, Lord, afterwards, go out and apply your word. And I pray that we would do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning I want to talk to you simply about the compelling love of Christ. Uh, I don't always worry about titles a lot, and uh, this is a title that just came right out of the passage, uh, where it talks about the the love, the love of Christ compels us in verse 14. But the compelling love of Christ, we need to think about the compelling love of Christ. We need to think about it often because we need to realize that we were, if we know Jesus as our Savior, compelled by the love of Christ to begin with. And now we need to be compelled by the love of Christ to continue to live for Him. And actually, we quite often talk about the compelling love of Christ as far as it is the love of Christ that draws people to himself so that they realize that they need to know him, that they can know him, that he wants them to know him, that uh, they can know him and know that they have eternal life with him. And so his love, that sacrificial love that he displayed on the cross, compels people to come to him, to come to know Jesus as their Savior. But this morning's passage is more about the compelling love of Christ as far as we who are already believers being compelled by Christ to be what Christ would have us to be. And I often say it this way, it's not original with me, many pastors and preachers have said this, that we will live the rest of our lives and even for eternity as a, as a thank you to him for what he has done for us. Paul starts out in this passage, he's writing to the church at Corinth, so he's writing to believers. And he says in verse 12, For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. So Paul is saying, and he says this to the Corinthians a few times, 
that I don't need to come with a letter of recommendation from other churches, from other people to you because I've been with you. And actually one of the longest ministries he had, because Paul, as you know, traveled around and led people to the Lord and churches got started and he, uh, he had been in Corinth. Uh, one of the longer times that he spent in any one place was in Corinth. And so these people knew him. And he mentions to them that he preached to them the whole counsel of God, and that he did not withhold anything, and that's, that sort of thing. And so he didn't need to come with letters of recommendation. And in verse 13, he says he didn't need to recommend, recommend himself either. He says, for if we are beside ourselves, and it's for God, for if we are of sound mind, it is, or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Uh, Actually, verse 12, he says, we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf. Because you know us. We know you. Paul knew them well enough that he was able to write 1 Corinthians to them. Uh, 1 Corinthians was a little different flavor than 2 Corinthians in that it dealt with things that they needed to correct. You know, they were involved in, in things that we would even consider to be even the world we consider to be heinous. You know, there was some incest, there was taking advantage of each other as believers, taking people before secular court, other believers before secular court rather than being able to settle differences, especially church differences within the church. Because after all, he talked about the wisdom of the people. Uh, and they, uh, he didn't say it this way, but he's probably thinking about the book of Proverbs when it says, that the Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So why did he say, he did say, why do you go out among those who do not have that wisdom? When don't you have people that are wise enough in the church to settle the differences of the church between church members? But he says, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are sound minded, it is for you. <laughs> Paul was considered by many to be out of his mind, beside himself. And uh, of course, Jesus the same way, John the Baptist, the prophets of old, uh, you know, they were considered to be beside themselves, sometimes out of their mind. I've even had church members in the past come up and talk to me about somebody. I remember one case where I had a Sunday school teacher who just, he just believed the Bible and he lived the Bible. He taught an adult Sunday school class and, and I just loved watching him. Hearing him teach is watching and living. And uh, we were, I was talking to another person in the church about that Sunday school teacher one day and something that he had said. And the other member looked at me and said, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about him sometimes. And I said, well, I said, the thing's out of his mind. He's in good company. Think about the Apostle Paul and others. <laughs> and this church member said, I'm not sure about the Apostle Paul either. <laughs> anyway, you know, uh, wrote more scripture, uh, preached more places, used by God in probably one of the mightiest ways of anybody that's ever lived. And uh, yeah, you know, we're not sure about him. And I'm sure about him. I'm sure that he lived for the Lord. I also know that he was a sinner because he told us so. <laughs> and because nobody's not a sinner other than Jesus. But if we were beside ourselves, he would insist for God, for if we are sound minded, it's for you. Paul was living for other people. Living for Jesus first and for others. And then he says in verse 14, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. Paul was compelled to live the sacrificial life that he lived because of the love Christ showed to Paul. Paul was going around. You, you remember, if you've studied the book of Acts at all, you'll remember that he was going around and he was killing people torturing and killing people of the way. Love that title for the church, by the way. People of the way. What a great title because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. But Paul, uh, the church was, the people, he was persecuting these people of the way. And he was going around doing that. And then, remember Jesus appeared to him in a great light and he said, he said, uh, hard for you to kick against the goads. Paul had a, a, a kind of a problem that created itself by what he was doing. He was going around and persecuting Christians 
And as he persecuted them, and he even wants some of them to die, remember Stephen? And he wants some of them to die, and he, and he was watching that they did not give up their faith, even on their very life. When their very life was at stake, they didn't give up their faith. And Paul was starting to feel the conviction of it. He realized that there must be something to all of this. And Jesus said, you can't kick against the goat. You can't fight the conviction. And he saved Paul that day. And of course, Ananias was given the responsibility of baptizing the person that he was most afraid of. <laughs> uh, Saul, the one who was persecuting the Christians. But Paul was compelled by the love of Christ, what Jesus had done for him. That reminds us of Romans chapter 12, and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you uh, present your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly accepted one to God, which is your reasonable service. Living sacrifices. Some people would call that an oxymoron. How can you be a living and a sacrifice at the same time? Sacrifice always has to do with death. But it does even in this case, because we die to self and become alive to Jesus. And so we live and we live as a sacrifice, that lifelong and eternal thank you to Jesus for what he's done so that we can know him and know that we have eternal life. The second verse of Romans 12 says, be transformed. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove it is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And how do we renew our minds? Much time with God and prayer and, and his word. But we are compelled by the love of Christ that is restored that bestowed upon us. And if he died, then we need to die to self. And if we know Jesus is our Savior, we have become alive in him, having died to self. And so we need to continue to die to self because we're all bent. Believer and unbeliever, like we're all have a bent towards, you know, wanting our own way. When what we really need to do is have one Jesus' way, one God's way. And so we have to die for self. We have to know that's not what God wants. That's what I want. That's not what God wants. I want. I need to make what I want what God wants. I need to make His will my will. And so uh, He says He's compelled by the love of Christ. And then He says in verse fifteen, He says, and He, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. One died for all. Christ's love was the greatest love. John 15, 13 says that, that greater love has no one than this, and he who lays down his life for his friends. But Jesus did lay down his life for his friends, and he laid his life down for his enemies. He laid his life down for those who were sitting against him. In Romans chapter 5. We might die for somebody in our life, a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, somebody that's been good to us or lives a good life. But would we die for our enemies? That's what Jesus did. And now while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and it was him that we were sinning against. Christ died for all, so all who accept this truth and know the Savior should feel compelled to live for him. Be a living sacrifice. The great thing about all this is that we are not just serving one who died for us, but one who also rose for us. We serve a risen Savior. You know the hymn? We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Know that he is living. Why? He lives inside of me. He lives through me and in me. Compelled by love. But compelled by the love of Christ that he has showed to us as believers. Him, by his love for us, that we would do what he would have us to do. And if unbelief, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, you say you, can, you should feel compelled to love the one who died for you. Don't let his love, that's for you being in vain, because he wants you to know him and have eternal life with you, and have, with him in heaven. We also need to be changed by love. Compelled by love, and changed by love. If you know Christ your Savior this morning, you have been compelled by love. My question, have you been changed by love? Because I know a lot of people, probably you do too, that profess to know Jesus as their Savior, but it's almost like they want that to be the truth without it changing them. 
I've seen people and I've heard people. <laughs> I've even heard people use foul language when they when to emphasize that they know Jesus. <laughs> and and that, that one always, you know, pretty much blows my mind. And kind of makes you wonder what, what do you say next to that? And uh, but it, it needs to change us. We need to change from the old vulgar ways or immoral ways or even just ungodly ways that we lived by when we didn't know him. Paul emphasizes throughout his letters that why would anyone who knows Jesus live like someone who didn't know Jesus? Book of Ephesians is all about that. Why would we ever want to live like an unbeliever if we're a believer? We need to be changed by love. Christians should no longer look at others even strictly from a human viewpoint, but now see them through spiritual eyes. Verse 16 says, Therefore, from now on, we, reward, we regard no one according to the flesh. We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We are not in the flesh anymore. We know Jesus in a different way. We might have known his name before we come to know him as Savior. We might have known some things about him. We knew that some people believed that he was the Son of God, that he came here to earth and lived a perfect life. We might have known some things about Jesus from a fleshly viewpoint, but now we know Jesus because we have a relationship with him. And we know him as the one who died for us so that we could have salvation and the one that we need to live for because of who he is and what he has done. We regard no one according to the flesh. Have you ever thought about this? There's, there's a movie years ago now, an old movie now. I still have trouble figuring that out. You know, somebody says an old movie and they're talking about from the 1990s or early 2000s or even 2010s now. When I think of an old movie, I'm talking about a movie from the 40s and 50s. I don't know why that difference is there, but anyway. Um, but an old movie called The Sixth Sense. I'm sure some of you have watched that, maybe all of you. Remember what the boy said? He saw dead people. He saw dead people. And I asked you this morning, do you see dead people? When you go out to your workplace or to school or to the shopping center or to the doctor's office or wherever you go in life, do you see dead people? I guarantee you, you do see dead people, physically. But do you see them through the eyes of Jesus? Do you notice that there are dead people among you? Do you, do you see that when you go out and look, and I'm not saying you have to know who is and who isn't, but do you realize when you walk into a, a busy place, there's a lot of people in it, that some of those people are probably dead people. That is, they have not become alive in Christ yet. Do you feel, do you see them and do you notice them? Maybe you know some of them. Maybe you work with people that, that don't uh, know Jesus as their Savior. Maybe you have family members that are that way. Do you, does it give you a heavy heart, a burdened heart, that there are people that are all around us every day that are not on the way to eternal life with Jesus in heaven? but instead are on the way to eternal separation from God in a place of torment the Bible describes as the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And does it burden you to where you want them to know that, like you do, that you're going to spend eternity with God? You're going to enter the gates of pearl and walk the street of gold and see the gates of pearl and the many precious stones, the crystal sea, the crystal river. But more than anything, you're going to see Jesus if you know Jesus as your Savior, that's the way it's going to be. You're going to see Jesus, and you're going to know Him, and you're going to be like Him because you're going to see Him as you are and as He is. And no negative thing will ever enter. No death, no sorrow, no sickness. We're going to spend eternity in the presence of God, praising God for what He's done so that we can be there. There's only two alternatives. Only two eternal destinations. So if you know that you're going to heaven, we should have a burden for those who do not know that. 
We obviously ought to see Christ differently than when we were unsaved. And everything should have changed. Look at verse 17. Probably one of the most familiar verses of Scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We are, we, we are changed by the love of Christ. The way we see things, the way we see other people, we shouldn't just be judgmental. We have a tendency sometimes to be that way. And uh, I'll think of the co-workers that are doing things just Sometimes I've seen co-workers do the wrong things the wrong way because they wanted to. That's, they do better, but they did it anyway. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and and uh, the answer, way too often, is they don't have the Holy Spirit living within them telling them to do the right thing. That should make us judgmental. That should make us burdened. We should feel for those folks and want them to know Jesus and do what we can for them to hear about Jesus, see Jesus living in us, hear about him from us, have the eyes of their understanding opened by the Holy Spirit, and come to know Jesus as their Savior and have the gift of eternal life. How we see things, what TV programs we watch, what, what movies we go to see. I've had people ask me, have you seen this movie? And sometimes I'll look at them, Especially if they're a believer. Sometimes if they're not a believer, but especially if they're a believer, I can tell you by the title that I don't want to see that movie. I'm not trying to be hard. I'm just trying to speak the truth. I've walked out of movies after paying good money. I've turned videos back in without having to watch them because the first five minutes told me that this is not what I expected, not what God wants. I need to feast my eyes upon it. We need to be sacrificial that way as well as sacrificial for others. That is, we need to give up things that we think that we think might be good for the moment. You know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. There's three areas that Jesus was tempted to do the same thing. You know, down uh, before Satan, uh, uh, turning the stones into bread, jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Jesus did the right thing, didn't he? Quoted scripture and moved on. <laughs> and and uh, uh, Adam and Eve got it wrong, didn't they? Because those were the three areas that Adam and Eve were tempted in, too. They got it wrong. Jesus got it right. We have an example of Jesus, and we need to follow it. We need to be changed by the love of Christ. We also need to be commissioned by the love of Christ. We are actually commissioned by the love of Christ. Verses 18 to 20. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God wants in Christ, God was in Christ reconciling, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now when we now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you in Christ be, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Commissioned by the love of God, by the love of Christ. All that we've already talked about is true and so much more. Compelled and, and changed by the love of Christ. We need to be reconciled by the love of Christ. That is, God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Verse 18 at the end says, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Then the verse 19 says, committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now the word reconciliation, according to the dictionary, is to restore to friendship or harmony. Not too bad of a definition. The original language here for this word, reconciliation, or being reconciled, pretty close to that. Being brought into a right relationship with someone. When we're reconciled to God, we're brought into a right relationship with Him. We're brought into a relationship with Him. And as Christians, we are reconciled to God. Sometimes we have to be reconciled to God, brought back into a right relationship with Him. God reconciled us. He does not need to change. We do. He brings us back into a right relationship with Him. My wife used to sing with a gospel group years ago, and they sang a song I think was entitled, Guess Who Moved? And it talked about 
It talked about uh, uh, getting away from God. Guess who moved? It wasn't God. God says that he is with us always. And he also says that if we draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to us. Now, if we're not drawing nigh to him, does he move away? No, not drawing nigh to God is the same as drawing away ourselves. And so when we are getting distant from God, it's because we are moving away from him. And so we need to be reconciled to him at that point and brought back into our relationship with him. God then gives us the ministry and word of reconciliation. That is, he takes us out to the world then and tells them how they can be reconciled to God. And we use our lives and our words, every thought, word, and deed, they say. Isn't that true? We need every thought, word, and deed needs to be what God would have us to be so that we are pleasing him, glorifying him, and reconciling the world to him, telling them how they can come into a relationship and a right relationship with him. He calls us to announce to others that they can, should, and better be reconciled to God. Better be. Otherwise, it's the alternative destination rather than heaven. It's that place of torment for eternity. He calls us to be ambassadors. We represent the king as if the king were speaking himself through us. Because why? He is. Because he is. We represent the king of kings and the lord of lords. Too many times in my life I've been ashamed of my representation of Jesus because it hasn't been a real representation of Jesus. It hasn't been good. And so I ask for forgiveness and ask him to empower me to do better. And he will. And that's how we grow in Christ. Ambassadors, we represent the king. We should want to live like the, the king we want us to live. How does God do all this? Verse 19. That is, that God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He does it through Christ. Obviously, his sacrificial death on the cross. He does it through not imputing our trespasses to us. Basically saying, not holding us responsible for what we were responsible for. That is, now I'm not saying that God never holds us responsible for the things that we do wrong. As believers, he's going to do that. Hebrews 12 is all about being chastened by God when we do that which is wrong, so that we come back into a right relationship with Him. Not for the sake of punishment, but for the sake of coming back into a right relationship with Him. But He doesn't eternally impute our trespasses to us, does He? We still, to this day, deserve eternal separation from God in that place of torment. But because of God's great mercy and grace, we no longer have to face that. And we need to be thankful for it. Because Jesus is the only way for that to have happened. Jesus was willing to be the plan of our redemption. Willing to be the plan of our redemption. The old hymn writer wrote, He left the splendor of heaven, knowing his destiny, was a lonely hill called Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. If that isn't love, I don't know what it is. But he came here. And carrying out the plan of redemption, he lived, he came and was born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life among wicked, sinful people who he came to save, but who, who for the most part rejected him, ridiculed him, mocked him, rejected him, and sought to destroy him. Finding no legitimate reason to destroy him, they made stuff up. They falsely accused him, accused him illegally tried him, and wrongfully condemned him. And carrying out that condemnation, they beat him and spat on him. They put a robe on him, crown of thorns on his head, a reed in his right hand, and mockingly bowed to him. Then they put his own clothes back on him and had him carry the cross that they would also, and did also, nail him to and hang him on. And he hung there and suffered and died, but it wasn't to pay the penalty for his own sin because he never sinned. It was for the sins of mankind that he died. Yours and mine. It should have been us rejected, mocked, and ridiculed. It should have been us beaten and spat upon. It should have been us carrying that cross. It should have been us nailed to that cross. It should have been us hanging and suffering and dying on that cross. But 
In Jesus' mill, as one old preacher I heard used to hear said, that our dying for our sins wouldn't buy us three seconds in eternity. We could do whatever, pay whatever penalty we want to pay, and we could still not satisfy the just demands of a perfect, holy God. Jesus knew that he could. His death could accomplish that, and be thankful that he realized that and did that because he's the only one that could. He was the only way, the only option. There was no other option. Jesus had to die for us to have salvation and eternal life with him in heaven. So he didn't impute our trespasses to us. And he died for us. And as he hung on the cross, he even said, Father, forgive me. They don't know what they do. He was all forgiven. He died for that sacrificial death. Why? Because he wanted us where he is. That's an amazing thing, by the way. He said that in John 14, didn't he? That where I am, there you may be also. He was going to go through all this for the apostles and for you and me and for anyone that was willing to follow him. He was going to go through the sacrificial death and did go through the sacrificial death so that we could have eternal life with him in heaven. Those who were up sinning against him. Finally this morning, cleansed by love. We are compelled by the love of Christ. We need to be changed by the love of Christ. We are commissioned by the love of Christ. We need to be cleansed by the love of Christ. Look at that verse 21, another very familiar verse of Scripture. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God the Father made him, Jesus the Son, God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The substitutionary death. He took our place. He was the propitiation, the satisfaction for the just demands of a perfect holy God for our sin so that we can have eternal life with him in heaven. That's the reason he did it. That's the reason he did it. So that we can be where he is. That's an amazing thing. Something we need to thank him for frequently. So this morning, we are all being compelled by the love of Christ to live a life that's pleasing to him, if you don't know him as your Savior, you're being compelled to come to know him as Savior. So that you can have eternal life with him. If you do know him, you're being compelled to live that life of thank you to him. To live a life that's pleasing to him. You need to be changed by him. We need to be changed by him. We are commissioned by him to do all that we've been compelled to do. And we need to be cleansed by him when we step out of line. That's far more frequently than it ought to be. But he's willing to forgive us. He says that if we confess our sins, he will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us all in righteousness. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've never said, Jesus, be my Savior. Jesus, forgive me. I want to know you and I want to know I have the gift of eternal life. And he will give it to you. He's promised that. And he always keeps all his promises because he's God. The God who cannot lie. Maybe you're here this morning and you do know Jesus, but you haven't been following him. You haven't allowed your life to be compelled by him to do the right thing. You haven't been changed like you ought to be. You haven't been following his commission. You haven't been cleansed by him recently. Whatever the situation may be, whatever your spiritual need may be, I'd, be loved to, I'd love to go to God's word and prayer with you to find the answer to that spiritual need. That's where we'll find it, God's word and prayer. I'm going to be standing down in front of you as you saw this done. And uh, you come as, as we sing, or see me afterwards, whatever the case may be, whatever you're comfortable with going. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to proclaim your word this morning. Help us to not resist the compelling love of Jesus, but to actually live for you. To be changed by you. To answer your commissioning. And to be cleansed by you. And to live a life that's pleasing to you before others. I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that they would not leave this place without knowing you. And if there's anyone here this morning that's not where they need to be with you in any way, that would change you this morning. In Jesus' name I pray.
without you, I fall.